are somewhat more conciliatory. In our post-9-11 world of radicalized Islam and suicide bombing, there is a more obvious need than ever for peacemaking with revolutionaries. Global po political relations are increasingly volatile, increasingly unstable. And globalization and militarization, as driven by the US in particular, creates poverty and animosity and thereby breeds jihadism, anti-imperialism, anti-Americanism, and terrorism. Peacemaking with revolutionaries is the work done by practitioners who use dialogue, negotiation, education, and other forms that make communication possible in order to resolve conflicts. Now, how do we get beyond terrorism? Because we know that the whole sort of lexicon of terrorism is now part of the structural unconscious of everyday life for US citizens. To Israel and the US government, for instance, Palestinian organizations are terrorists, but Palestinians and their defenders regard them as freedom fighters, posing a terrorist invasion and occupation of their homeland. How do we begin? to develop peacemaking strategies in that context. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration championed the Contras as freedom fighters against the totalitarian state of Nicaragua. I put the totalitarianism in single quotation marks. Whereas Nicaraguans reviled them as US-sponsored terrorists who had killed thousands of innocents to overthrow their elected government. And the Contras murdered children and women purposefully targeted them. And so what, what we, you know, Menachem Begin was the leader of the infamous Urgun group that carried out political assassinations, and in 1946 he bombed the British headquarters in the King David Hotel, King not killing 90 and wounding 45. Yet he became the Prime Minister of Israel and won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1978. Nelson Mandela in the ANC, African National Congress used bombs and assassinations in their struggle against apartheid and thereby reviled as, were thereby reviled as terrorists. And yet in 1993, Nelson Mandela was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize and became an international hero. While the distinction between terrorists and freedom fighters can sometimes be difficult to discern, often it's palpably clear. It is imperative that we resist corporate, state, military, and mass media definitions in glib conceptual conflations in order to distinguish between freedom fighters, those who defend themselves or others against unprovoked violence, and unjust aggression, and so-called terrorists, those individuals, those groups, or governments who initiate aggressive acts of violence towards others in attempt to control, exploit, or oppress them. So these are issues we need to debate. These are issues we need to discuss these are issues we need to come to some sense of, of understanding about, not simply avoid or refuse discussing them. You know, I, we just have to begin to, to, to bring them out into the public square, begin to unpack them, begin to, in a sense, you know, undress them for what they are instead of just refusing to dialogue about them. The Reagan administration organized and funded the Contras, of course we know, which was a ragtag band of murderer and merc murderers and mercenaries who blew up ports and sought to destroy the economy. They killed tens of thousands of innocent men, women, and children with bombs, grenades, and bayonets to slice and dice thousands of innocent men, women, and children. Now, we don't discuss these issues. Well, I remember when Reagan, you know, was being put to rest. There was nothing about this in the newspapers. No discussions of the Contras in the Reagan administration, in the public corporate-owned media, which was shameful. And I was, big, I was wondering about this. And I was reading an article recently by John Pilger, the journalist John Pilger. I love John, John Pilger. And he wrote this, and I'm going to quote John Pilger. He said, I remember Edward Herman's marvelous essay about normalizing the unthinkable. 
For that's what media cliché language does and is designed to do. It normalizes the unthinkable of the degradation of war, severed limbs of maimed children, all of which I've seen. One of my favorite stories about the Cold War concerns a group of Russian journalists who were touring the United States. On the final day of their visit, they were asked by the host for their impressions. I'll have to tell you, said the spokesman from Russia, that we were astonished to find after reading all the newspapers and watching TV day after day that all the opinions on all the vital issues are the same here. To get that result in our country, we send journalists to the gulag. We even tear out their fingernails. Here you don't have to do that. What's your secret? <laughs> you know. What's the secret? This is John Pilger. It's a question seldom asked in newsrooms, in media colleges, in journalism journals. And yet the answer to that question is critical to the lives of millions of people. On August the 24th le um, last year, the New York Times declared this in an editorial. If we'd known then what we know now about the invasion of Iraq, we, <coughs> the invasion of Iraq would have been stopped by a popular outcry. Well, this amazing admission was saying, in effect, that journalists had betrayed the public by not doing their job and by accepting and amplifying and echoing the lives of Bush and his gang instead of challenging them and exposing them. What the Times didn't say was that had the paper and the rest of the media exposed the lies, up to a million people might be alive today, including thousands of U.S. military men and women and hundreds of thousands of Iraqis would be alive today. That's the belief now of a number of senior establishment journalists. Few of them, they've spoken to me about it, Few of them will say this in public. This is John Pilger. And he ends this by saying, I began to understand how censorship worked in so-called free societies when I reported from totalitarian societies. During the 1970s, I filmed secretly in Czechoslovakia, then a Stalinist dictatorship. I interviewed members of the dissident group called Charter 77, including the novelist Zedder Urbanik. And this is what he told me. In dictatorships, we are more fortunate than you in the West in one respect. One respect. We believe nothing of what we read in the newspapers and nothing of what we watch in television because we know it's propaganda and lies. Unlike you in the West, we've learned to look behind the propaganda and to read between the lines. And unlike you, we know that the real truth is always subversive. <clears throat> Vandana Shiva has called this subjugated knowledge. The great Irish muckraker, Claude Coburn, got it right when he wrote, never believe anything until it's officially denied. <laughs> One of the oldest cliches of war is that truth is the first casualty. No, it's not, says John Pilger. Journalism is the first casualty. Well, you know, I work in the, I'm going to, I've got, I think, four more minutes here, so I'm going to end on a note uh, on education because I work in the field of education. And we have to remember that it, Malcolm X said education is a passport to the future. And one of my great mentors was one of the person, um, persons that I had the opportunity to work with for a number of years, uh, not intimately by any means, but I got a chance to work with him in person and spend some time with him, both in the United States and in Brazil, um, was Paulo Freire, a great Brazilian educator who wrote a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And Freddie did not dis was a great admirer of Malcolm X. Of course, I'm a great admirer of Malcolm X. Um, but Freddie took education, I think, sort of one step beyond the concept that education is a passport to the future. He agrees with what Malcolm said, but would add that the approach one takes to education is as important as the content. Thus, before one went, ventures off to become educated about revolutionaries, one must decide on the proper or ideal approach to take for research and comprehension. It's thus crucial to approach revolutionary groups, societies, or collectives through a respectful and non-positional lens, which critical pedagogy favors, which Paulo Freire favors. This is a challenging approach that relies on dialogue and consciousness raising among all the groups involved. Our own approach relies on teaching how, in the words of Ramon Grosfuguel, the racial ethnic hierarchy 